All right, well, it's uh, top of the hour. I think it's ready to uh, ready to get started. You ready, Dave? Yeah, I'm ready, and and thanks for the nice messages. A couple of people are thanking us for lunch. Oh, and, uh, good to hear. You. Yeah, and so let's take a step back. For those of you who are a little bit new to us, Dave Lampson, I'm National Sales Manager for NCSI, and Brian Hotzik, I'm on the technical side here. I'm the technical team, and um, we, we do these quite often, and uh, people who have seen us may already be trying to figure out what that city is behind us, what knowing that, that they're going to get a oh, gift card. City. But uh, we're going to trick you a little bit today because we want to talk about something else. We do something else here kind of fun. It's our Pro Pick Challenge. It's based on the NFL season. Um, although the season has started, we would love to have more people join. If you're not already a member, we've got about 100 people playing so far. And it's real easy. You just pick the winners. It's not like you're picking against the spread. Um, there's even a button if you want to do random choices that, that takes about uh, all of about five seconds to do your picks for the week. And um, we put that link that was on that slide that you saw earlier. We can put it in chat and send it afterwards too. Please do sign up and we'd, we'd love to have you participate in that. Um, but we're here today. We're going to dive into uh, service and asset management, but mm -hmm. a little bit different. We do lots of these where we're focusing overall on the general enterprise service management yeah. um, features and functionality. But you want to speak to something a little more specific today, right? Yeah, yeah. More specifically, one particular component that uh, I have a lot of customers struggle with, and that's CMDB asset database. You know, all of these kinds of topics we're going to be we're going to be deep diving into today. Um, because really it's hard, right? It is something that is very difficult. I talk with lots of different kinds of customers. And for the most part, people don't have it figured out. That's one thing I want to make sure that, that everyone kind of understands is I'm a little worried we have that, uh, that social media problem, right? When I look at social media, I, I deleted all my, most of my accounts, but you know, I understand the premise, right? Hey, here's these, all these great pictures of my perfect vacation and how great I look at this. And I look at my life and I'm like, man, I, I'm way falling short of that. And so I think that we have a little bit of that same problem in the CMDB asset space that everyone assumes that every other company's got it figured out and it's an easy process. Why can't we do it? But in reality, no, it is incredibly difficult. And there are lots of different pitfalls and challenges inside of it. And I want to kind of talk about some of those and go over those today, but understand that it's difficult there is not a magic fix that solves all of your problems. It doesn't. If there was, I, yeah. we would have written it down and sold it in a book and you know been billionaires. It is a difficult thing. It really just takes persistence to you know to 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 keep it happening. And, and you mentioned to me earlier. Uh, hopefully, I'm not stealing anything from your presentation. But even sometimes people who think they have a good handle on it maybe don't fully understand what we're trying to accomplish, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, different people in different, uh, even inside of the same department. Um, I mean, look at look at the word CMDB. You know, what, what does that even mean? I bet you would go to 75% of the people in IT and ask them to define what a CMDB is, and I bet 75% of those people would fail. They don't know what that means. They couldn't tell you that it's a configuration management database. They couldn't tell you what its functions were for. And so it's it is a little bit of a cryptic thing. And some of our names like CMDB didn't help anybody out by calling it something like that. Um, and so, you know, even just the perception of it and training people what it's for has to be part of the process, right? You need to get people in the IT department, that other 75%, they've got to be educated on it. You can't do it without their help. Um, I've always heard a, a really funny statement that says, you know, a CMDB cannot be one person's job. That That's a single way to make it fail. Say, Bob, you're in charge of the CMDB. Please make it great and let us know. No, it's got to be everybody's job, right? Uh, I added something to the, I added a new virtual machine. Well, did you add to the CMDB? Um, I created a new website that our customers go log into. Well, is that in the CMDB, right? I retired a system and it's no longer in production anymore. Well, did you go into the CMDB and market as such, right? It's everybody's job to maintain it and keep it up to date. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna dive into a lot more of those uh, details here on this specific uh, conversation. I would love to keep it uh, interactive. I can't hear you guys, but uh, you know, please type in chat, and then Dave here will yell out the the, the comments that we have in chat as we're, we're kind of going through it. So you're gonna start at the whiteboard and educate us a little bit further, and yeah. actually do a little bit of product demonstration. Yeah, we'll we'll show it a little bit, but uh, let's talk. You know, kind of big picture first, and. Uh, some of the ideas that we have. Okay. So let's head on over. Um, all right. So I draw, draw up here a little bit of a Venn diagram. And I want to talk about first some of the differences.
between a CMDB and an asset database. Maybe you call it AMDB. If you want to, you can, right? There's not a great uh, 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 solidifying of a name like we did with CMDB, um, but you'll hear me call it asset database or AMDB or something like that. All right, so, uh, so this Venn diagram, it's really interesting. It's a lot closer than you think. I had to draw it as they're kind of separate, but I want to talk about what you feel like should exist inside of CMDB and what should exist inside of an asset database. And we're going to have some strong opinions here, first and foremost. You've got to, you've got to understand that. I bet I'm going to drop something here and you're going to disagree with it, right? That needs to be okay. We need to understand that it's a good, healthy debate. I want you to have this exact same deb debate at your organization, where you're the one leading it and having the other IT members arguing over what is a CMDB and what is inside of the asset is a good, healthy thing to have. So let's talk about some of the purposes. If I had to give one purpose to the CMDB, if I had one overarching um, kind of concept behind that, um, I would say that CMDB is for technical reasons, right? It is a technical database. I use it in IT in order to understand, you know, what my configuration items are and how they relate to each other. I use it for change management. I use it for incident management and so forth. Um, but that's its primary purpose. If we talk about asset, who's its primary consumer? I would say this is a business function. This more has to do with the concept of the business has to have an accounting of all of its uh, purchases, right? Um, and when we, we understand that, I think that goes a lot way to understand what the drivers for someone doing asset management. I found that oftentimes it's not IT that's trying to push asset management, right? It's the CFO, it's the CEO, it's the CIO. And that's okay, that's, that's actually a great thing because having buy-off from these executives is, is fantastic for having a project move forward, right? Um, but think about that for a minute, that uh, what are some of the differences between an asset repository and a CMDB? I want you to uh, think about some of the life cycle elements behind it, because we're going to draw up here a couple of things. We're going to say, okay, what, what is an asset and what is the CMDB? Let's talk about some pretty basic stuff, right? What is a server to you guys? Well, most people would say, you know what, it's both, right? We're going to have that in the CMDB because it's absolutely a CI. Uh, we need it for lots of technical reasons, but uh, it's also an asset. We paid $15,000 for it, right? I need to keep track of that. So that's pretty straightforward. A server is there. You know, a workstation is. That's pretty straightforward. Same kind of idea. You know, a router, a switch, etc. cetera. Um, we could just start going through most of the uh, things that we consider pretty obvious things in IT. But I want to talk about those kind of fringe elements for a minute. What about a website? Is a website fundamentally an asset? Well, no, right? I don't purchase it. I didn't have a purchase order uh, behind it. Um, we'll get into like contracts and so forth later, but it doesn't have a serial number. I don't discover it on the network, but you know what? It's incredibly important to my CMDB because my website is where my customers come and hit it. And then that has a server on the back end, you know, so on and so forth. So I've got to keep track of that. What about what we just described there? A contract something that is keeping track of that website. It's not actually a website. Maybe I'm paying a service for a company to host my website, right? That's not really a technical thing. It's a, well, I pay this month every, this dollar amount every month, and here's the termination details. So that's almost certainly just on the asset side of the house. Um, as we keep going through this, um, we can bring up other examples, or if, or if people want to even put it in chat and talk about that, um, you know, we absolutely can. Um, other things that are, you know, a real mess um, are, uh, you know, what do you want to do with any kind of BYOD stuff in here, right? What is a BYOD? Do you own it? Is it an asset? Well, oh, holy cow, I don't know. Is it? It's weird. It's not, but I've got to care about it. Maybe I need to keep it in my CMDB. I've got to keep track of that asset. It is a BYOD device. It's their phone, but I'm mandated to make sure that they have a passcode policy on it. So I may need to have it exist in here, but is it an asset? We don't own that thing. So, well, geez, maybe that needs to be pushed over here. BYOD, which should only be in the CMDB, it should not be in the asset repository. So what I want you to do is I want you to um, go through this exercise in your organization. You're going to have different views on what should exist in the AMDB, what should exist in the CMDB. Um, and you need to kind of solidify that and come up with a standard and say, here's our policy. 
here's what we should agree should exist in the CMDB. Here's what should not. You know, what about things like uh, consumables? You know, is a consumable something that you would track in the CMDB or just in the asset repository, right? You know, so go through this exercise, have it written down. You've got to start with a good foundation of the CMDB and deciding what goes in the CMDB is almost one of the very first things um, you need to worry about. Okay, so let's talk about um, a couple of other things. I want to talk about uh, pragmatism. Um, a big part of this argument here of what should exist in the CMDB and what should exist in the AMDB, um, I think we need to be very pragmatic about it. Why? Because if you read some of these books about ITIL, ITIL, you know what? They, they've got some real strong opinions, right? Um, and I disagree with some of them at scale. Because the problem is that generally speaking, it's the same ITIL across the board, right? The VA, the VA has 400,000 computers. They're using the exact same ITIL you are at your 200 user organization. Well, does that make a lot of sense? Should we have that be that way? Well, maybe not. So um, pragmatism is let's grab the parts that make sense, let's ignore the other parts. Like for example, um, the CMDB. If a device is not providing a service, it should not be in the CMDB. There's a race to remove that because it is no longer providing a service. And you know what? That's a very common thing, right? Um, we want to remove devices from our database that haven't been seen in 30 days. That's actually a big push I get from customers a lot. They come to me and they say, hey, I've got this CMDB or really any kind of repository of your assets. And they say, please tell me how to purge these pieces of data. I want to set up a filter that says, if I haven't seen it for 30 days, I don't want it in this report. And you know what? From a, from a technical perspective, I get it. It makes a lot of sense. But I want to restate that same question in the scope of an asset. I want to say what I'm going to say to my CFO. So imagine it like this. I'm exaggerating a little bit. All right, Mr. or Mrs. CFO, I appreciate you giving me $4 million to buy all that equipment for IT last year. Now, I'm going to go into my tool and I'm going to race to erase every record of that uh, from all of our systems. And I'm pretty sure we're going to keep uh, track of it, right? But, well, what sense does that make? You're telling them you're trying to race and erase the data, yet we need to keep track of that asset. We need, what if we need to understand what its warranty was or its depreciated value or do you have a certificate of destruction for it, right? So that's where the pragmatism around the CMDB might need to start kicking in more, right? Don't race to, don't race to erase things out of your CMDB. That's my personal philosophy. I think that is the wrong answer. You need to have a workflow that says set those items to, you know, disposed of or no longer in service or, you know, we can have an indicator that they are no longer a member of the CMDB and they're no longer in production, but I'm not a fan of trying to erase them. We can't go back and do any kind of data gathering on them once they're purged out of the system. So that's that pragmatism that I'm talking about. Um, even if some of the other things are trying to push us and drive us, because that's what uh, uh, CMDB healthiness is supposed to be all about. Let's be a little bit more pragmatic and, and try and do some of those asset related features. Um, another kind of concept I like to talk about is, is this. Um, CMDBs are, and, and asset repositories are a very strange thing inside of technology because they have to deal with um, a, a principle of faith, which I think is a very strange thing to talk about when we're talking about technology because we don't usually bring that into the equation. You know, the concept of faith. And, and, and you know, what do I mean by that? What's the, what's the issue behind it? Well, a um, couple steps back. Why do we do a CMTB? In, in all honesty, why? You need to have that frank conversation with your business and you need to understand why. If you're a small organization, maybe the answer is you shouldn't have one. That is an acceptable solution, in my opinion, for smaller organizations. But, you know, as you grow, it's, it turns into kind of a, a have to have. But that CMDB is not something your IT department likes to use. So you got a system administrator and they are forced to do change management, right? They don't want to do change management. That's not fun. It's paperwork. You might as well say it's like filing your taxes. This is not fun, exciting stuff. They just have to do it. So I'm a change administrator and I go log into my change management tool and I'm forced to pick which, uh, which uh, system I'm going to make my change against. I'm going to log in. I'm going to see this, right? I've got a domain controller. That's the server I want to go and do, uh, make my changes against. What happens if I see this? 
This happens very frequently where we turn on discovery. And we're going to get to a lot more in discovery in a little bit, but we turn on a system that finds servers and we found the same server three times and we've got duplication in there. I feel like what's going to happen when a server admin logs in and they see this is they lose faith in the tool. Right then, right there, they say, you know what? This is junk data. I don't like this because you. this is my server. I know it very well. You've got it in here three times. So I'm automatically discounting your entire database. So when um, you're asking me to keep it up to date because you're the CMDB admin, I'm just the dumb server guy that you know is forced to do change management and look at your dumb CMDB. When you make me do this, I'm not going to keep this up to date. I'm not going to keep the next system up to date because it's already bad and out of date. Um, if you haven't heard, there's this principle called the broken windows policy. And it came from, um, you know, kind of urban planning in the, you know, 60s and 70s. And um, what it was was, you know, in big cities like New York City, for example, um, if you came upon a building that was abandoned and it has a whole bunch of windows and they're mostly broken, what's the big deal for me to pick up a rock, throw that rock into an already destroyed building? It is no big deal. Most people would just, eh, I'm just going to go do that. Who cares? But if the building is intact and every one of those windows is intact, no one wants to be the first person to screw it up. Generally speaking, people aren't going to pick up the first rock and throw it. They'll throw the later rocks, but not the first rock. I think that you need to take this example and apply it to the way that the CMDB works. If they log into it and they see junk, they're going to keep it as junk and they're not going to maintain it. If they log in and they see it nice and clean, the way that it's supposed to be, and everything is there. Duplication is just one example. I'm just trying to get the point across that it's got to be consistent or it erodes very quickly. So you've got to maintain high percentages. It's got to be 99% accurate because if it's 90% accurate, it is going to erode quickly because people are not going to keep it up to date. So we need to keep that as more sacred. So here's what you don't want to do. Let's talk about some of the pitfalls. Let's take one of our systems and let's import it into the CMDB, right? Let's take something like Active Directory and let's suck that data in there. Okay, we did it. Uh, Active Directory, garbage when it comes to computer data for the record. Doesn't have serial number, doesn't have uh, warranty. I mean, it's got like computer name and maybe sort of kind of the operating system. Oh, it's greater than Windows uh, 2000. Yeah, thanks a lot for that. That's very helpful. Um, but then we're going to go and import the next data source. Oh, well, we, we actually store our data in SCCM, right? We're going to bring that in. Okay, well, it was the same data as Active Directory. So are, how are we going to deal with those duplicates? Is it based on the name of the device? What's going to happen there? Okay, we're going to have to for sure go and figure that out. But if you start thinking about it, we're missing stuff. This is just workstations. Where's uh, printers? Where's phones? Where's you know all these other things? As you start to go and add these other data sources, and say I want to bring them in, you're going to come to this realization that, you know, there's way too much overlap. You know, uh, we got other b places that can scan data, like for example, Rapid7 or Qualys or Tenable or, oh, hey, we use VMware. You know, we've got all this information inside of our VMware database. Let's bring that in. Um, oh, and, hey, we're also using uh, uh, our neurons for MBM. That stores all of our uh, phones and so forth. Let's bring that data in. The issue ends up becoming that we don't have a source of truth. That's why we're creating our CMDB AMDB, right? Is because Active Directory is not good enough. SCCM is not good enough. They're good at their silos, their small focuses, but not one place of data has all of it. We are trying to create that single source of truth. And we talked about some of the pitfalls of, of duplications and so forth. So I don't like this model where we take data from data sources, scoop it out in the CMDB. I want to treat our CMDB as more sacred. So it's one step up from that, and I want to bring it in somewhere else. So uh, the way that we do it in the Elanti platform is with the Neurons Discovery Engine. And what we're going to do here is we're going to go park that data over here into a uh, data lake. So a data lake is just a place where I can temporarily hold that data um, uh, as part of it. So uh, first of all, we're going to do deduplication. So we want to prevent that problem. I think that's probably the biggest issue that we have in CMDBs is duplication of data. Um, next is normalization. Normalization, normalize, gives us the ability to clean the data up. Dell, Dell Inc., Dell Computer Corporation, Dell EMC. Does it help us having four instances of that? No. Let's shrink it down 
you know, have it be just called uh, Dale, for example. There's a really crazy offshoot of that deduplication. Has nothing really to do with CMDB and asset, excuse me, but um, it's a really cool function. And that's our reconciliation, you know. Back to that concept of when you're talking to the CFO, I get on lots of calls with customers and I say, how many computers do you guys have? How many workstations? And you know what I hear? Well, that's an interesting question. Uh, you know, Active Directory says 800, SCCM says 900, um, the accounting department says 1200. So somewhere between 800 and 1200, right? It's these huge ranges. Well, it's because none of these are that data source. Reconciliation lets us go in and say, hey, what's the difference between this one and this one? Oh, it's these five? Uh, maybe there are stale records in Active Directory. They didn't have the SCCM agent installed on them. Maybe they weren't enrolled in Intune. So it makes it easier for us to indicate where, where uh, we have uh, stragglers or people missing out on things. So, But that's just kind of an offshoot benefit that we have. One of the other things that we're going to do is discovery. Now, there's a fundamental problem, in my opinion, that a lot of people associate discovery that it actually is asset management, or it is, they usually don't assume it's a CMDB, because they usually don't know what a CMDB is, technically. Whoops. No throwing markers, Dave. Uh, it's a danger zone in here. Um, so they don't know what a CMDB is, but they will come and say, hey, I want an asset repository. And then they go and describe to me that they want it to sweep the network looking for devices, and that's it. Well, discovery is not asset management. It plays into it, but they're fundamentally different things. Um, if you don't want the purchase order number, if you don't want the depreciated value uh, disposal record, you don't want asset management. You want just discovery and inventory. So just kind of keep that in mind. All right, so our discovery works where we actually take a copy of our MAC address database. It's not as big as you think. You can store thousands of MAC addresses in a couple of kilobytes. We store that on one of our devices on our subnet. Let's say for argument's sake, it's 192.168.2.x subnet. Um, we're going to actually sweep that network and look for other devices. We have the, the device that has an agent on there do it. All right, so when it goes and it finds a machine, it's going to probe it. Um, if it's SNMP based, like a router, printer, switch, great, we're going to do SNMP probing. We're going to pull that inventory information back. If it's Active Directory based, we can actually probe it and do the same thing, pull that information back. But inevitably, what's going to happen is this you're going to find a machine on the network and you're going to probe it. What if I brought my laptop to your company's uh, location and I plugged it in? When you go to probe it, are you going to successfully inventory scan my laptop? Do you know my password? Sorry, guys, if you do, you got to let me know. That's, that's information I need to know. But no, you don't know my password. This is going to be a dead end. So what are you going to gather from that? You are going to gather an IP address and a MAC address. And I want to ask a question for a second. Back to that philosophical question earlier, how we're having that argument of what should be in the CMDB, what should be in the AMDB, et cetera. What value does having an IP address and a MAC address in a CMDB provide? What? Not only is it not valuable, I think it hurts the value because back to that faith. People log in and say, what on earth is this? So my argument is no, you are not getting any value from discovering and failing to do any kind of interrogation. So what my recommendation would be is have as few realistic ingestions into the CMDB as possible, ideally just one. I don't want to have two cooks in my kitchen, I just want one. I want it to come from the neurons discovery data lake and I want to hijack it right here, and I want to put a filter on it. And I want to say, it's okay if I have the serial number. If I do not have the serial number, do not bring it into the CMDB. I use serial number as a little bit of the canary in the coal mine. If you've gathered serial number, you've probably gathered a lot more than that. But if you cannot ascertain the serial number, you almost certainly have nothing. It's not perfect, but it's, it's pretty darn close. So I put a filter before we bring it up into the CMDB. Now, I can still look at the data in the data lake. Absolutely, tell your security team to go track down that IPS mechanism. Hey, what's going on? Someone go fix that. But we just don't bring it up into our CMDB. We have treated this more sacredly, right? So we put a filter right there. So this is the Neuron's discovery ecosystem to help populate the CMDB. Uh, obviously, I highly recommend it uh, as part of a population process. Uh, the, the, the older models around, um, uh, you know, just ingesting with spreadsheets or, you know, talking to on-premise equipment um, is just uh, not as ideal to do that. All right, so let's go over and let's actually kind of watch some of this in action. I want you to see what's happening here. 
So um, let's walk through uh, some of the discovery elements that I just talked about there. So first of all, we've got uh, the connectors. Connectors are those, uh, if we jump back over there, those little lines that you see right there going from Active Directory and so forth up to neurons. So creating a connector is very straightforward. You just simply go in here and say, well, yeah, I want to go connect to Dell for warranty information or you know, CDW for purchasing data, AWS for EC2 instances. Uh, here's a bunch of Vonti products I can talk to. Let's talk to Jamf for Mac uh, data, Office 365, SCCM, Azure, Intune, Okta, Qualys. Um, why, why would we pull down from Qualys and one log on? Well, when we get to things like software, um, well, should it be in the CMDB? And what about SaaS? Is it really software, right? No, they're logging into a website and they might even be logging into it from their personal computer at home. How do we keep track of it? Well, we hijack the single sign-on sessions and do it that way. Uh, connection to VMware, ServiceNow, Tenable, Rapid7, et cetera. Um, I really like our vulnerability scanning engines, the Rapid7, Qualys, Tenable, et cetera. Um, because they sometimes have reach that we don't have elsewhere, right? Where it's going to, um, you know, grab something that maybe we would have missed otherwise. All right, let's go set up VMware just as an example. So you can kind of see more about how that works. Um, here you can understand, uh, you just give it a name for the connector. We use something called a connector server. Connector server is just a fancy word of an agent that we have. Because think about it, this is a cloud tool. How do I talk to on-premise things? Well, I use that uh, connector server. Um, I've got it on my like, endpoint manager host right there. It's easy. So I'd say, let's connect to vcenter.vertrillo.local. Ignore cert warnings because I don't have a good cert on it. Administrator at vsphere.local and then the password. Um, do you want to bring in virtual machines that are powered off? Well, yeah, that's your choice. You can turn these on or off. And let's go grab this uh, every day at whatever o'clock. There you go. That's it. So I've now created a uh, import mechanism for all of the things that are in VMware. Now, next time I log in as my CMDB, all of my VMware uh, components are going to be there. So um, look at the, oh, you almost have to go backwards from the type. Go back to that Venn diagram we drew up. Look at each one of the things you draw up on there and then say, how are we going to discover this? How are we to discover phones? How are we going to discover printers? How are we going to discover workstations? You're going to get to the point where some of them are not discoverable. You're going to get to your AS400 mainframe. You're going to get to the diesel generator out in the parking lot. When you come upon those weird one-offs, and I'm not joking, if it is a one-off, meaning it's either singular or maybe you've got two of those AS400s, don't worry about discovery. Just go put that thing in the CMD by hand. Don't feel like that's some kind of failure. Get it in the CMDB. It doesn't change a lot. You don't buy new mainframes every other day. It's not going to be hard to keep track of that. So don't twist yourself into knots on how we discover things that are very difficult to discover. Simply putting it in by hand and back to that part where, we, where everyone's maintaining it so we can keep it up to date that way. All right, so uh, let's go talk about the reconciliation, that kind of offshoot benefit that doesn't technically have anything to do with CMDB or asset, but it's just a fantastic... Uh, tool. So here under Smart Advisors, here's device reconciliation. Here's all the different data sources that I have. I'm going to set them all in the middle to this ignore column. Then I can go back and say, okay, well, show me everything in Active Directory. For example, I've got 25 devices that are in Active Directory. Cross-reference that against people that have, in this case, an Avanti Neurons agent. Well, what it's told me is there's 16 that are the difference between those two. 16 that are in Active Directory, but someone forgot to put my agent on it. And if I click on this device, it's going to take me to that page. You know, And this is where I can start to suss out more information. I might be able to say things like, well, yeah, this machine right here was only found in the Active Directory connector. If that's the case, it's probably old and out of date. And it's probably just a stale record. We can most likely purge that. Versus another one, oh, no, look, this got found 13 different times by a whole bunch of stuff. We probably just forgot to put the agent on it. So it's encouraging me to, to go and install that. Um, we also have the ability when you install the agent just to get more, you know, real-time views of your devices. You can kind of see here, um, even down to a GPS level, if I kept zooming in. So uh, having up-to-date inventory information obviously is an important part of maintaining a healthy CMDB. So here's how you can see the, that works. Okay, let's shift over for a minute. And um, I haven't actually showed the CMDB all the way. We're half hour in. And this is the first time I've actually had a tab open as a CMDB on it. So let's get into the, the details of it. I want to call out a bunch of maybe smaller pieces of the puzzle that people aren't necessarily aware of um, so that we can start to, to flesh out functionality inside of the CMDB.
Okay, first of all, at the top, we don't call it a CMDB. Of course we don't, because of course we don't. It's called a CI up at the top, which that's fine. It's just, you know, uh, uh, you could change the name of that if you wanted to, but out of the box, it's called CI. Okay, so now I've got this big list of things. How do I discern the difference between the CMDB and the AMDB? There's not a button for asset database. There's not a button for CMDB. So it's, it's kind of a, a hidden thing. And, and I wish it was a little bit more obvious, but let's talk about what that actually means. Over here on the side, notice that we've got a saved search. I want to talk about that saved search. That saved search is currently set to not all, it's currently set to something called managed devices. Managed devices is effectively the CMDB in the tool. Now, you don't have to operate it exactly this way. And again, there's going to be strong opinions on these topics I'm about to talk about. So consider them generalities. But the CMDB is not all devices here, right? If I click on all, um, it's going to be too hard to understand the difference between the two. So I'm actually going to go um, back to my managed devices. Oh, that's, uh, that's a faster go like that. I'm going to edit this saved search so that we can take a look at it. So notice what it's doing. This is a saved search that we have that is essentially excluding items. Notice how it says where the CI configuration item type is not equal to, right? So we're essentially kicking people out that we don't like from a type perspective, and they are exclusively inside of the AMDB. So for example, there is a built-in type called IVNT underscore unmanaged asset. We're gonna talk about with the asset processor here in a little bit, but we need to know that that's just kind of an incoming unknown bucket, unknown device or unknown asset is, is what it's called. And we've got to do something about that. Someone would have to potentially take it out of unmanaged for it to become into the CMDB. We're also going to exclude things like contract or facilities assets or VoIP assets. And this is my query. I can change it the way that I work. I can open this up and manipulate it. This is just the out of the box version of, of what this query looks like. All right, so we specifically say when it's not one of these types, it's inside of the CMDB. So let's go back there and change to all. What if I wanted to change that? Let's talk about the asset processor for a second. So the asset processor gives us the ability to say when a piece of information comes in, meaning like a new device as part of an import process, we'll talk about the many import methods in a little bit, but just as part of the process, what happens? So you can see we've got three different uh, platforms here, Windows, Unix, and LAN Probe. Let's open up this Windows one. So let's talk about what these options are. Up here at the top platform, that's pretty straightforward. It's Windows. These are the matching fields. This is how we're looking up what uniqueness there is about the system. And notice that serial number um, is inside of there. There's an option to create a new CI. You know, some customers, there may be a reason not to create the CI when we're doing the ingestion process. That's pretty rough. I, I can't come up with a lot of reasons not to do that, but you know, you just need to know this checkbox needs to be checked. Then this right here, this is important. I think a lot of people don't understand how this works. This is the type that it is going to land in. So it's gonna land as an unmanaged asset. So philosophically, again, there can be many different ways to approach this. I keep telling you how I want you to keep your CMDB sacred. This is a great example of that. When we process things, we don't put them right in the CMDB. We put them in the unmanaged asset bucket. Then what we would need to do is have a human being search through here, through all. They would go down here to this type called unmanaged asset. They would look at that asset. They would make a determination, like here's a fantastic example of one I probably would not. I've got no data, I've got nothing. I've got a name and a serial number and nothing else. I don't think this is necessarily worthy of my CMDB, but you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's your guys' choice. But what you can do over here on the side is open up more, go down to administrative actions, and, and it, you know, we could have this be a button up here at the top. It doesn't have to be buried under this menu, but you can see we can change the asset type. I am now as an administrator taking it out of that inbox or whatever you want to call that unmanaged asset kind of place that we parked it, and I'm changing the type. I'm changing the type to computer, and the subtype to, I don't know, whatever, desktop or laptop or, or something like that. It is no longer in that incoming bucket. It is now in the correct type section. Now, that is something you wanna at least have conversations about from a security perspective. Do you want anyone in the company being able to change the type of anything, right? Maybe, maybe not, I, you know, that's just more of a, a, of a process uh, conversation that we need to have. 
So now that we can see this device is actually a, um, you know, uh, inside the CMDB. If we were to go back and, you know, take a look at it and refresh, you don't have to refresh, it no longer exists under this unmanaged asset section. So asset processor, be aware of it. Understand how this works. Uh, you can look at some of these things around merging of duplicate CIs and FQDN and so forth. I'm going to talk a little bit later on how Discovery does some of these elements for us, but you've just got to be uh, aware of that. Okay, let's talk about those types. I want to open up uh, our type and talk about subtypes. Um, let's go ba -ba -ba, open up laptop right here. Okay. So a type is a computer, actually, to tell you the truth, I think this is the best way to look at that, is to click new up here at the top. This shows me all of the types. Types are difficult to create, subtypes are easy to create. A little bit of an oversimplification, but I'll show you how easy it is. Most of what we would consider in the CMDB is going to be in the computer or computer adjacent space, right? So they're in a computer, and then I can pick the subtype right there. Why I say it's easy is because look, there's even a pencil right there. If I have the appropriate permissions, I can go and add one. Look, uh, I added an ATM for my bank and credit union customers. Uh, I have a, a casino company. We added a slot machine. Um, you know, it's very easy to go and add uh, types uh, into the subtype section right here. So pretty straightforward to do that. All right, let's go take a look at a, a machine, or better yet, I want to talk about how we import data from here in our neurons discovery and we get it inside of our ITSM tool. Wait, Brian, can yes. I interrupt for a second? We did get a Go question. Ahead. Can you use Hi, the everybody. asset processor with an Excel slash CSV import file? Yes, because the asset processor is a meta layer above the import mechanism. And what I mean by that is if we go to the import section right here and we say, I want to import data, right here. Look at all the methods that we have. We've got a bazillion methods. We've got spreadsheets. We've got databases. We've got et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All of these connect, all of these uh, ingestion methods, they all roll up to the asset processor, including the neurons discovery one I'm going to show you later. Think of the asset processor as the very, very, very end of the line, simply saying what bucket, meaning what type should I put it in? So it's just at the very end, regardless of the import source, be it spreadsheet or neurons or whatever else, if that makes sense. Um, all right, so let's go uh, over here to the neuron section here. So I've got all my data discovered. How do I get this inside of the tool? How do I get this inside of uh, neurons for ITSM? Well, we actually, for lack of a better term, we pull the data from neurons, from, uh, neurons for ITSM, reaches out to neurons discovery, and it pulls it up. Um, the way that it works is, uh, I'll talk about that spreadsheet. So here's the spreadsheet stuff that you were, uh, the question was just asking about. I can absolutely go in here and say, yes, let's import via this spreadsheet. You can click on it right here. Um, it, we can go through the details here, but uh, I would just go and upload a file. I don't think I have any spreadsheets with assets anywhere close, but uh, hey, maybe that's sort of kind of something. I'll just upload that. And then what's going to happen is when you go through this, we'll get to the object mapping section and uh, where are we going to store this as and, and so forth, but you know, that's not a very good uh, uh, file to, to go through the process, but there's even a filter section where we control what actually gets imported. So what we do for Neurons Discovery, if we scroll down here, is we click on Neurons Discovery Connector Device. It's this one right here. This one's very confusing. So I've got to get very precise on how this works because it's the documentation does a poor job at it as well. When you turn this on, it says, oh, hey, there is a cloud connector API path. And when you click next, right, or better yet, let's just hit this test button just so you can see what it looks like. It came back with a success. But in reality, how did it know about my neurons tenant? If you look really close, notice that they're not the same URL. They're actually in different instances. ncsi.trysasit.com is my neurons for ITSM. Yet my neurons discovery is actually neurons cloud out of cloud.com. So they're technically two different instances. They are unrelated to each other and they have their own URLs. Well, what this configuration does, you cannot see this if you are a cloud customer. There's something called the operations console that is only available to either uh, cloud operations people or if you install the product on premise. And there's a setting in there 
that you specify the URL and uh, another thing, this device ID, inside of this. You just can't see it. So it's strange for you, you just have to look at this screen. What you have to do is you have to call it support and you have to say, please marry my tenants together. I want these settings for this tenant to be connected to this tenant and then it will work. Uh, if you're on-premise, we can send you a URL on, on how you go to Operations Console and fix that. So know that that is a process. And when we go next here, we can actually get to the point where we talk about the filter settings. Remember how I talked about um, my filter that I think is an important aspect? Um, this is what it would look like, right? Where I would say, I'm going to look at an attribute. You can pick any attribute, but I think serial number is one of the better ones to take a look at. Um, and it's not empty. Because if it is empty, I don't want it to be part of the process. So discuss that filter setting. Um, talk about how it could be helpful to keep that database clean. And then, you know, go implement it as part of the import process. Okay, uh, let's go and talk about a couple of other things. Uh, I want to talk about the relationships that our devices have to each other. Um, this is something rather mature. I, I, I think we struggle with this sometimes in technology. Again, back to that social media nonsense. I worry that people think everyone else is doing this when in reality, not very many people are doing it. Um, from a maturity perspective, if you're in the Fortune 500, absolutely your CMDB needs to have service dependency mapping. It needs to understand the relationships of the devices to each other. But you know what? Everyone else, you've got to convince me that you need it. Uh, it's not that you don't, that's not true. But again, if you're a 200 user manufacturing company, it may or may not make sense to invest in it. So from a maturity perspective, put this next part of, of uh, relationship mapping pretty far down the maturity path. Um, but that's understanding of uh, how the things connect together, right? A CMDB is not just a list of all of my things. It has to understand that those uh, devices, those components, they relate to each other. And understanding the impact. You know, if I were to reboot this storage device right here, what is going to be the impact to the business? That's one of the biggest reasons we do change management. We're trying to prevent those oops moments. Oops, I didn't know that that, spread, that uh, server is going to affect your database when I reboot it. I thought it was just going to affect mine. So understanding the relationships of these uh, servers or CIs uh, is an important part of the process. Making those relationships is a piece of cake. You press this link button right here, you find the server, you say whether it runs on or is hosted by or received data from, and you press link. That's it. Now where is the rub? How do you know which one's the link? Someone, a human being has to provide that knowledge. And that knowledge is kind of hard to come by. So on paper, it's easy. In the real world, it's very, very difficult to create these relationships that we have. Again, back to that, if we can make sure our business owners, when you're adding a device to the CMDB, it's not just, did the server get added? Did you go into the relationships tab and make sure the relationships are uh, connected and working well there? Um, did you go and uh, create a, a lockout window so that they can't make changes at certain times, right? It's not about just getting it in there. It's then actually using it as part of that process. So know that we do have a magic automatic discovery tool that can find these relationships. It's called Neurons Discovery with Service Mapping. Um, and its goal is to go in and say, okay, yeah, we are going to actually, oh, whoops, kick me out, let me log back into it. It's an add-on, uh, Neurons Discovery with Service Mapping. But what it does is it can understand th those communications that we have between those different systems, right? If I open up, I think this one has a scan on it, you know, it can understand how they communicate with each other, what ports are being used. Let me just try and zoom in here, see if we get any more detail. You know, what ports are being used, what does it connect to, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So instead of having a human have to have the knowledge that, well, yeah, this one connects to that one, this would go and discover that for us and have the uh, system be populated. My rule of thumb on this is 500. If you're at 500 servers or below, Eh, setting up this tool is usually not worth it. You should just go do it by hand. If you're at greater than 500 servers or you change a lot, you have a very dynamic environment, you know, the servers could have migrated and manipulated and changed since this morning when I first looked at it, you know, that would be a reason to, to have a tool like uh, Neurons Discovery with Service Mapping. Um, so that gives us the ability to uh, automatically go and gather that and populate uh, these connection things that we have uh, here. Okay, so uh, that was kind of it. That was uh, the, the stuff I wanted to uh, get across. Um, so uh, Dave, Dave, do we have any more questions come up on the...
on the chat there? No other questions, but okay. that was a deeper technical dive than we usually do during these webinars. Um, That's what you told me to do, Dave. You uh, said go deep. They but, want it. But particularly the, the people me. yearn for CMDB, give it to them. <laughs> well, just my point being that this might be good information to review after the fact because uh, some of it was over my head this first time <laughs> or new to me. So uh, we will post this on our YouTube page so uh, uh, you can review it at your convenience. Larry will also send a link to it in yep. the follow-up email that we have. I just want to make sure my understanding, I think you touched about it when you were over there, uh, the CMDB and the asset database you kind of, you drew up the Venn diagram and they were separate, but really they are the same database inside our tool. We, well, we kind of talked about that when we we're talking about those types that in reality, you are correct. It is the same database when you get into the, 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 the back end, but it's that type and subtype logic that is making the deciding factor, right? It's putting it in the right circle or the left circle. Um, so type is a differentiator between our CMDB and area. And that view that an administrator has will be dependent on their role as to how they're logged into the system. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's a great point that you bring up because I kind of pointed out when I opened up CI that I thought that was a dumb thing to call our CMDB because it's that the singular unit of an ad item in it instead of the CMDB. When you log in as an out-of-the-box role for an asset administrator, it's not even called that. It's called hardware uh, hardware assets, I think is what it's called. Doesn't even use the word CMDB. So roles can change the names of things in the interface. Um, definitely be mindful of that in a good way, right? It's a good thing that we can call it a hardware asset, but it's a bad thing because it's going to be confusing between different roles of the, the tool. But I, I wouldn't be doing my job as a sales guy to reinforce the fact it's the same platform within Avanti. Mm -hmm. It's basically the same licensing. Most versions of IT service management come with asset management and vice versa. Um, and there are bundles where you can actually include those discovery tools mm -hmm. and some of the other things. The neurons discovery with service mapping, that is a separate component and that mm -hmm. would be uh, something that, that you would purchase separately. Yep. But other than that, most of it's available in a very cost advantageous bundle and they can get everything we talked about today. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, Avanti has recognized that. You know what, these aren't different things. ITSM is not completely different from ITAM, which is not completely different from Discovery. So we've got these nice licensing bundles that just wrap it all up together. I just buy that one license and, and I get everything that I talked about. And uh, I think the today. takeaway today is we probably have some customers that are own the licensing for both, may mm -hmm. only be utilizing one, and that's the kind of thing we can help you with. If Absolutely. You, if you've seen something today that you want to dive deeper into, let us know. We can get your, your salesperson involved. We can do an entitlement review to make sure exactly what you have access to. Yep. Um, and we can discuss those next steps to make sure that if you own the product, we want you to get the most out of your investment that you can. Yep, absolutely. Well, thanks for joining everyone. Uh, make sure to sign up for ProPick. Um, uh, it's, we're going to put the link in the follow-up email yes. slash chat, right? Yeah. Um, appreciate everyone attending. Uh, uh, please give us feedback if you've got particular topics. You know, we thought this one was a particularly good topic to, to talk about, but uh, um, if you got something in particular you'd like to hear about in the future, you know, please uh, give us a suggestion um, and let us know. And if you want to have a further uh, technical conversation, you know, just hit up your sales rep, have them get me on the phone, and we can uh, expand upon it. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Take See you care. later.